This podcast is brought to you by Progressive. Most of you aren't just listening right now. You're driving, cleaning, and even exercising. But what if you could be saving money by switching to Progressive? Drivers who save by switching save nearly $750 on average. And auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Multitask right now. Quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. At Bed 365 we don't do ordinary. We believe that every sport should be epic. Every home run, every hit, every inning, every play. From the moments that are legendary to the ones that fly under the radar. Whether it's a walk-off grand slam or a base hit to center field. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment. It's never ordinary at Bet365. 21 plus only must be physically located in Virginia. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. The following podcast contains explicit language. Hide your children. Hi, I'm Josh Levine, and this is Hang Up and Listen for the week of April 29th, 2024. On this week's show, we'll discuss the record-setting run of quarterbacks at the top of the NFL draft and whether we, the football-viewing public, should have any confidence that these teams know what they're doing. We'll also talk about whether Anthony Edwards can bust through the NBA's gerontocracy. And finally, cross-country skiing broadcaster Chad Salmella will be here to school us on the remarkable record-setting season of American Jesse Diggins. I'm in Washington, D.C. I'm the author of the book The Queen and the host of an upcoming slow burn season on the rise of Fox News and various and sundry other matters. Stefan Fatsis is out in Greece. We prepared you for this. Do not be shocked. Um, but you're going to hear him a bit later in our cross-country skiing segment. And you should check out his piece published in Slate on Monday, that's adapted from his afterball about the Ivy League and NIL. And it has some new original reporting from Stefan about what seems like the first Ivy program to actually raise money to pay a basketball player to stay in school. So you should check that out. We'll link to it on our show page. Um, with me, as always, from Palo Alto, it's three-time Slow Burn host, Slate's emotional investment columnist, great column about the WNBA last week, Joel Anderson. Hey there, Joel. Hey, what's up, man? Good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, and we'll be hearing a little bit from your WNBA piece later in the show. Yeah, yeah, we're going to follow up on it. And actually, I do want to say, I spoke to Nancy Lieberman-Klein for the piece, and she didn't make it in there. But I think I got a like, little juicy tidbit that I'm going to hopefully drop along somewhere along the way. Also with us this week, one of our favorites uh, in Los Angeles, the co-host of the greatest college football podcast ever created, Split Zone Duo. He's also a Slate contributing writer, Alex Kirshner. Hello, Alex. Josh, Joel, a pleasure to be with you as always. Are you guys um, going to be fighting over the fact that Kiki Iriafen transferred from Stanford to USC to pair with Juju Watkins? Have you developed any LA sports fandoms in your brief time since moving to the city, Alex? I will develop LA sports fandoms as soon as lifelong Angelinos develop a Chargers fandom. <laughs> <laughs> USC women's oh, basketball could I feel like you could uh you could roll with that. And maybe you should. Perhaps I should, but I can't fake it with my favorite teams, you know? I find that hard to do. And if I could do it, I would do it because I'm a <laughs> Pittsburgh Pirates fan and Dodger Stadium is like four miles from my house. <laughs> yes, right. And like, you, oh. if I could do it, I would do it, but I'd be faking it. And I think I owe myself and my community more than to lie. Very honest of you. Thank you, Alex, for your integrity. Now, yes, Joel. Oh, well, I, I just want to just take one quick second here to say something because my friend listens all the time and I want to give him his props. Congratulations to Taylor High School in Texas for finishing third in the National Academic Decathlon in Pittsburgh this week. It was a very big deal, man. It's a, like a 4A school in Texas, and they won. And, you know, Alex, you'll be happy to know that my friend loved the Permanente brothers. You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot, there was a lot to, lot to cover right there. But I know that my friend Matt Womble, Principal Matt Womble, would have loved to hear that. So uh, congratulations to those guys. 
French fries on a sandwich and a decathlon victory. Very, very cool to get both of those in one trip. <laughs> Alex, I swear to you, he said he by the time he got home, he had already texted me and said, hey, man, I'm still thinking about that sandwich. So <laughs> y'all are doing something right, Pittsburgh. I'm often thinking about sandwiches and our Slate Plus members, you know, both sides of the brain. Um, thank you, Slate Plus members, for making the show possible. And we want to let you know that in our bonus episode this week, we're going to talk about the media spectacle of the NFL draft, in particular, Nick Saban and Bill Belichick playing starring roles in various ESPN broadcasts. How did the old coaches do? What can we expect from them as broadcasters? And if you could only choose one to listen to for the rest of your life, which one of them would you pick? If you want to hear us discuss that, this week's bonus episode is available right now. And if you don't subscribe, shame on you. But there are two ways for you to hear it. You can either subscribe right now by going to Apple Podcasts and clicking Try Free at the top of our show page, or you can visit slate.com slash hangupplus to get access wherever you listen. The first night of the NFL draft was pretty much going according to plan Thursday night. Caleb Williams went number one to the Chicago Bears. The commanders picked Jaden Daniels at two, and that left Drake Make for the Patriots at three. And there wasn't a consensus about who might be the fourth QB taken in the draft or where they might go, but the Vikings were at 10th and the Broncos were at 12th, and they're both in the market for one, most likely Michigan's J.J. McCarthy. But then we got to the eighth pick putting the Atlanta Falcons on the clock. And you don't like doing that, right? Put the Falcons on the clock. And at that very moment, Falcons tight end Kyle Pitts was live on air with the Bleacher Report's Gridiron Draft Night coverage. Here's a clip. And with the eighth pick, pick in the draft, the Atlanta Falcons are taking quarterback Michael Penix out of Washington. Wow. Hmm, that's Ooh. surprising. Wow. <laughs> that's a slinger right there, man. Nice. They wow. just signed Kirk Cousins. This is completely out of left field. So, Alex, as the host of my favorite college football podcast, I know you watched and talked a lot about Michael Penix last season. Um, as great as he was for those Washington Huskies, were you surprised as everyone else that he went number eight? I was absolutely as surprised as everybody else. And I have just as negative a view of it as everybody else even with my complete respect and adoration for everything that he achieved at Washington and even that he achieved at Indiana, where good football things go to die. He was a hell of a college quarterback, and I root for his success. And this is just incredibly perplexing that the Falcons did this. So the case against it is um, that they paid $100 million in guaranteed money to Kirk Cousins, um, that by the Falcons' own admission, they're not expecting the number eight pick in the draft to start for them for years. Um, and, you know, he has a long injury history, uh, obviously, but also he's 24 years old. It's not like you're picking a guy who's 20 or 21 or that you're picking a guy um, like in the second round or kind of late in the f first round. So Joel, in terms of the amount of kind of money and salary cap they're devoting to quarterback now, the age of the guy and the fact that you're not expecting him to play. And this part seems a little more debatable to me, the fact that you're potentially pissing off the starting quarterback or at least confu <laughs> confusing him um, ab about what your plans or, or goals are here all, all seem to be pointing in the direction of this being nonsensical. Well, this is going to be a little heartless, but the person I feel least sorry for this and this whole thing is Kirk Cousins. Like, you're the dude who's the mercenary. You have no relationships down there. You took the money and you blew up all the relationships you had anywhere else. So, like, whatever happens to you, if if you're going to treat football like a business, sometimes football is going to treat you like you're part of the business right back. The person I actually feel most bad for, not even you Falcons fans, is Michael Penix. Like, he's going to be 24 when the season starts. And he's only, he's, I mean, they're pretty much the plan if it works out at best. He won't touch the field until like 2028 or 2027. Until so, he's Brandon Whedon's age. Yeah. And I mean, like, obviously there's a lot of variables in the middle of all of that, but like that kind of sucks, man. And that's always why I kind of have a fundamental problem with the draft with bad teams that have shown no capacity for making good decisions um, get to ruin the careers of other young football players. But I'm like, man, Michael Penix, he, what does he have to look forward to? But I guess to kind of close that up, the thing I, th I think about is that, well, you know what? 
uh, Kirk Cousins has been in the building for a while. He's still coming back from that Achilles surgery. He's going to be 36 when the season kicks off this year. I wonder if the Falcons were like, oof, he's not moving around like we thought, you know? It's possible. I think that to believe that this is going to work out requires a belief that the Atlanta Falcons are the smartest guys in the room. <laughs> and that has simply never been true in the history of the Atlanta Falcons. There are reasons <laughs> why you take a quarterback and, or I should say that there are conditions where you might take a quarterback and expect to sit him for two, three, four years and that be okay. And Penix and the Falcons meet the opposite of those conditions in every way. You just said it, he's already 24 one of the great benefits of having a quarterback on a rookie contract is that for a few years, if he's any good, you get cut rate production at the most expensive position in team sports. And that is completely off the table when for the next three years, really, it's a four-year deal, but really it's a two to three-year deal with the guarantees. You're paying Kirk Cousins tens of millions of dollars against your salary cap to be your quarterback. And when Michael Penix is already 24, and when the Jordan Love path of you draft a guy at 21 or so, and yeah, he sits for a few years, and then in his third or fourth year in the league, he finally gets to play, but he's 24 at that point, and he probably still has a little bit more growth in front of him, certainly a longer career in front of him. That just doesn't apply here, because Michael Penix Jr. is not just 24, but he also has an extensive injury history where you know it's really questionable if he's going to be a productive NFL player deep into his 30s. And so to bite off three, four years of this guy's career where he's not playing is a total disservice to him and also robs your team of the ability to get better during a window when you have to think you're going to be contending or you wouldn't have signed Kirk Cousins because he's 36. It just, as a mosaic, it makes no sense. In a vacuum... Maybe they just really like Michael Penix more than media did. Like, that's cool. The media is going to miss things. Draft reporting is a mess. But when you put their actions together, it just makes no sense to do this. None. Yeah, I mean, the NFL draft is really um, an exercise in irrational self-confidence. There have been extensive mm. decades-long studies that the only way to win the NFL draft is to do actually what the Philadelphia Eagles did over the weekend, which is just to accumulate so many picks to trade down, to trade with teams that are irrationally self-confident. So you just have lottery ticket after lottery ticket after lottery ticket because no team, maybe like Ozzie Newsome with the Ravens is an exception, but like if there's an exception, there's only one. Um, no team has ever been consistently able to win the draft just by outsmarting, um, outsmarting teams and just picking trading up and oh we tar we loved this guy we targeted this guy and he's our guy even though that's what every team says during the draft every year and so the one defense that i would make of the falcons and the defense they made for themselves what raheem morris the coach said is we're actually going to be so good now because our team is so great um that we're not going to get the chance to draft this high again and so we wanted to take this guy that we loved on the one chance that we had because this is the most important position in team sports. And so if we if there's a guy that we like here, um, then we have to take him. I don't think that's totally, totally crazy, but also, and whichever one of you guys wants to take this, just look back to the 2021 NFL draft when five guys are taken in the first round, among them Zach Wilson, Mac Jones, and, and Trevor Lawrence is the only one of those five who's still with the same team, Justin Fields being being another one from that draft. All of those teams thought they were getting their franchise guy. It's been almost three years now, and all of those plants have totally gone up in smoke. And so it's just the most fascinating conundrum to me, maybe in all of sports, is that you need a quarter. The only way to succeed long-term in the NFL is to get a, a franchise quarterback. And with all of the data that we have with college teams playing more like NFL teams and college quarterbacks of all kinds being more acceptable to be in the NFL. These teams still have absolutely no idea what they're doing and who they're getting. 
Well, I think then maybe, Josh, maybe the, the, we're looking at it backwards is that because they realize that there are no certainties at that position, that they've tried this more dynamic sort of team building, which is like, we'll get a quarterback and then discard him a year later from now, right? Like, there's like, well, we don't know what we're doing. And so, like, you do the thing where the Falcons, they just drafted Desmond Ritter, man. They, I mean, they, they just drafted him and they've already discarded him. Or like you said, in the, tw- the, the 2021 draft, all three of those guys are gone, right? Um, and I, I think it's a lot of, a lot of these. Did I mention guys, Mac Jones? They, Mac Jones too. Yeah. Four or five are <laughs> yeah. gone. Yeah. 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 And I really just think that it, it, I think it's both that we know that, that you can't really count on anything. We've learned enough over the years that, that you can't really figure out who's going to be great with the exception of maybe a handful of guys like the Andrew Lux or the John Elways or whatever. And that these coaches believe that, well, I have an offense that will, that will negate, um, the weaknesses of any of these guys that I can make anybody successful. They can, they can, they can look right now and say, Hey, you know what? We can make Brock Purdy a successful NFL quarterback. Like people, it's possible to do that. Maybe I can do that too. So who cares if we, if we take a big swing on the guy at number eight this year, next year it won't matter because we'll just draft somebody else. I think what's new about this is the degree of the gamble that's being made and the total disregard for the other ways that it fits into your roster management strategy. It's been happening for years because of exactly the dynamic you say that an NFL team will take a shot on a quarterback and dump them quick if it doesn't work out. And the 49ers did this when they traded off Trey Lance last year. The Steelers just did it when they drafted Kenny Pickett kind of later in the first round. Two years later, they realize he sucks and they dump him. And he's going to be the backup with the Philadelphia Eagles. And that's reasonably normal. You know, uh, in the 49ers case, they, they found a better guy. In the Steelers case, they think they found better guys, but also it was a later first round pick. And they probably knew at the time that it wasn't likely that Kenny Pickett was going to be their next franchise quarterback for 10 or 15 years. But the upside, if it did work out, was such that it was worth taking the shot. And yeah, it it works out that you wasted a first round pick, but I think people understand that you tried and that it makes sense in that context. What the Falcons did here, because of the cousin situation and because of Penix's age and where they are in their sort of competitive cycle made no sense. The Broncos uh, at the 12th pick, taking Bo Nix from Oregon slash Ooh. Auburn before that, was similar in that Nix is also 24. The Broncos just cut Russell Wilson and they're going to pay like $85 million in cap money the next two years. So they are also basically forfeiting the rookie contract benefit. And that's where this all starts to feel a little drunken to me is just like – that that nothing else matters and you're just going to try anything if you think a young quarterback might be able to play. I have to cut you guys off right before I let Josh go because we all are big college football fans. Can you think of anything more bizarre than if I'd gone back in 2020 and told you, you know, Bo Nix is going to be a first round draft pick in 2024? Like, would you have believed that at all? Or Michael Penix. I would not. Or Jaden Daniels. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's I mean that's <laughs> that's the thing. We're like so focused on the guys taking a number eight, a number twelve, and the Bo Nix thing. I just it strikes me as completely crazy. Like even cra- in a, in its own way, even crazier than the Michael Penix thing. Just because I don't think Bo Nix is as good as uh, Michael Penix, but like we're just skipping over the fact that Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, and Drake May one two three. Probably two of those three guys are going to fail. I hate to say it, but like the, that's what the the numbers suggest in terms of you know the the hit rate on these guys in recent years. And you know, just in fairness, we have to say whether it's Joe Burrow, top of the first round, Jordan Love, bottom of the first round, Jalen Hurts, second round, Brock Purdy, seventh round. You can point to lots of examples of guys taken in recent years who have transformed the fortunes of their franchises. And so it it does make sense that this is a kind of ec- exercise in hopefulness and, and wish casting. But the Bo Nix thing is just like too far for me. I just can't, I, I can't pretend, I can't go there. And if Sean Payton talks one more time about how if the Saints were just about to take Patrick Mahomes before the Chiefs <laughs> traded up to that spot, they were just about to turn in the card. We're done hearing about it, Sean. New Orleans doesn't need to uh, 
know about how close Patrick Mahomes was there. But like, if the idea is that like, oh, we can't let this happen again. We can't let the Patrick Mahomes of this draft, who's like never thrown a ball beyond the line of scrimmage. (laughs) We can't let that happen to us again. Like, yeah, good luck with that, uh, Sean Payton. In the next segment, is Anthony Edwards really going to be the new face of the NBA? No. Looking for an assist with your credit card but can't get a hold of anyone? Luckily, with 24-7 U.S.-based live customer service from Discover, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, you heard that right. You can talk to a real human and customer service anytime. Sounds like a real game changer. Make the right call and get the service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase, every day. That's 3% on your favorite products at Apple, 2% on all other Apple Card with Apple Pay purchases, and 1% on anything you buy with your titanium Apple Card or virtual card number. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City Branch, subject to credit approval. Terms apply. All right, before we get going, a quick word from our friends Shea Gildress Alexander and Chad Holmgren. What a pro wants, what a pro needs, whatever makes me happy sets me free. I've never actually heard that in my headphones before. It's somehow um, (laughs) much worse. Um, But Shay, Chad, thank you. We'll be hearing from them about 10 to 12 more times throughout the rest of the episode. But perhaps more to the point, If all goes according to plan, we'll be watching the 25-year-old SGA, the 21-year-old Chet, and their team, the Oklahoma City Thunder, maraud through the NBA playoffs for the next 10 to 12 years. And then there's 22-year-old Anthony Edwards of the Minnesota Timberwolves, who said this after his team's Game 3 win over the Phoenix Suns. Uh, I just want to kill everything in front of me, man. That's the main thing. Um, uh, Pretty much. That's all it is to it. Joel, the killing continued in Game 4 as Edwards scored 40 in leading his team to a first-round sweep against the Suns and his idol, 35-year-old Kevin Durant. So let's start there. Will we look back at this as a torch-passing moment in the NBA? And is Anthony Edwards the right guy to carry that torch? I don't know if we'll look at a first-round playoff series victory over the Phoenix Suns. Come on, I'm trying to hype it uh, up, Joel. (laughs) Torch-carrying moment. Uh, (laughs) It seems like a lot of weight. No, I don't think people will remember that. But in terms of him being poised to become one of those guys that would, you know, position himself as the best American basketball superstar. Yeah, I guess it's possible. Um, stylistic, stylistically, like he's really fun to watch. And that's an important factor in like who becomes the face of the league, right? Like part of Steph and, uh, why so many people were drawn to him and his game is that it looked like a lot of fun and it was really exciting to watch. And with, Ant, you know, Anthony Edwards, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, pretty, it's, you could argue that he has two of the best highlights this year. I mean, if you take that block, that game winning block at the buzzer and then that, the dunk over, I mean, just that dunk even over Bradley Beal. Like, I mean, it just, he's had highlights like that all year, but personality wise, yeah, sure, maybe. He'll become that guy. Like from the moment I became aware of Anthony Edwards, I was sort of drawn to him. You don't see that sort of personality uh, in front of the cameras. And I think some guys are getting a lot more comfortable showing that side of themselves. Can I actually interject? We've got another clip of Anthony Edwards' uh, personality. Mm. For those who are not familiar with him, this is from uh, an interview Uh-oh. at some point in the last few years. Sounds like you're just an athlete. Yeah. Any th- Okay, ping pong, baseball, football, basketball. Tennis, swimming. <laughs> Lacrosse, whatever you need me to play, I'm going to go do it. If there's some money on the line, I'm going to go do it. Can you golf? Whatever you need me to do. Okay. Hockey. Whatever. On the, on the ring. Whatever you need me to do. It don't matter. Got it. Trash can ball. We can do whatever you want. Trash can Cook ball. Food. You can go pro. Cook food. It, that's something to do. I'm, I bet I'll be A1 from day one. When you were reading your intro, that's exactly the <laughs> clip that I was thinking of. Right? It was exactly that. Like, I love that. But... 
off the court, and this is where people underestimate the difficulty in being somebody like LeBron James and basically having their whole life in front of the camera and having really no public missteps. Um, I mean, Anthony Edwards is a dude, man, that a couple years ago was fine for making anti-gay comments on a social media post. He was he was live streaming his comments and posted it, right? Then, I mean, it was just earlier this year where he had that little contratemps with a young woman where it seemed to be that he was trying to pressure her into having an abortion. It doesn't mean that he's a bad person. It doesn't mean that he can't, you know, uh, that, that people won't be drawn to him and still magnetize to him. But it just kind of, when you were talking about being the face of the league, that kind of stuff kind of can get in the way, I think. It is interesting to me how LeBron has managed to sort of stay above or like adjacent to almost any fray of controversy that's stuck to him over his career. Cause he's had plenty of them over the years. I mean, he had, there's at least what, like six or seven that you could probably think of over the, off the top of your mind of news cycles that have been pretty bad for LeBron, whether there was a, like early, early in his career when he was in Cleveland, uh, he was sort of describing NBA locker room culture and said something about not being able to trust a gay teammate. There was the Jewish money rap lyric that he shared on Instagram a couple of years ago. Uh, there have been all kinds of moments where he's sort of alienated a more left portion of NBA fans, whether it's with his comments on Israel or the NBA's like ownership class and kind of seeming like he wants to own a team. Uh, but LeBron has always sort of been able to, just by the sheer force of his greatness and because I think a lot of people have just reached the conclusion that he's a solid guy – has sort of been able to make those things footnotes in his career rather than anything that, you know, rather than even being seen as like in any way a controversial star. Uh, then obviously there's the entire like interaction of like the right wing American ecosystem with LeBron, which is a larger story. But he's mostly been able to just kind of be like the role model, the the hero, and not had his more, not had his lesser moments stick to the way that I think most sports fans think about him. And that's impressive and probably a skill that in an era where you're always holding a phone up to your face is going to be hard to replicate. Like, I don't know if John Morant would have gotten in the, the level of trouble that he got into the last few years in the NBA if he did not have the ability to go live on Instagram. And the same is true with Anthony Edwards in the last couple of months. And uh, I don't know if that means today's stars are – any different than yesterday's, but it seems like it's harder to not have these things come up over the course of a long and prosperous basketball career. The three guys I can think of since LeBron came in the league who are, have a comparable level of athleticism and kind of on-court magnetism are Anthony Edwards, John Morant, and Derek Rose. Um, Alex already mentioned Morant, who, you know, is suspended by the NBA for various incidents involving brandishing guns. Derek Rose was accused by an ex-girlfriend of rape and in a civil trial, her accusation, according to you know this this court, was found to be not credible. For Rose, I think the the thing that affected his trajectory earlier in his career was was injury. And I think we don't want to, you know, sit here and suggest that Anthony Edwards is on the, you know, he he's going down a a terrible path and like c kind of catastrophize the things that he's gotten into so far. Although the ab abortion thing did seem pretty bad, um, but as far as you know, how he's being kind of received in the NBA world and among NBA fans, you know, Joel, I can't think of a, another example of like Michael Jordan, Kevin Durant after the game talking about how Ant's his favorite player, Charles Barkley. Like, guys who are kind of conditioned to hate on younger generations and say that, you know, they're not as tough, that they're just jump shooters, whatever, whatever they say, all of these people are just saying, rhapsodizing about Anthony Edwards in a way that uh, I, I find to be very unusual. Do you know what I think a good analog for this sort of is within the NBA is Kyrie? I think because of the way that they play and the way that they carry themselves, they seem really cool, right? Like sure. whatever you think about like Kyrie's, you know, uh, more controversial uh, incidents, like they kind of, they seem like 
uh, cool in a way that is hard for most people. Like even players as great, even even people as cool as NBA players, it's very hard to pull off that kind of personality in public, right? And so I think that that's what they're drawn to as much as anything else. Because like, I mean, Anthony Edwards, I mean, yeah, he's, you know, I guess you have to say, argue now he's one of the top 10 players in the league right now. But I mean, he's not the best. Like, I mean, nobody's saying he's better than Jokic or or, or Luca, right? Well, you made the you made the point earlier. The fact that he's American, was born in in the U.S. and is like a native English right. speaker that makes a difference. And I do think that's a part of why some of the guys that you see talking him up. That's I think it's also a little bit of that too, right? Like, th- don't you think Alex is like a little bit of jingoism? Like, hey, this is the guy I like right here. He seems like the dude to take the take the NBA into the next generation. Probably. Like, I can't get inside Charles Barkley's brain, mm-hmm. but Charles Barkley and Anthony Edwards are from, I believe, the same part of the country. Uh, unless Anthony Edwards is from somewhere where his accent betrays. Uh, but <laughs> when it's like, yeah, like uh, I, we all root for, or a lot of people root for people from where they're from or who share like some kind of upbringing or background. And I could certainly see the NBA on TNT crew being among those who are like that. Let me interject about Barkley, Alex, because he's a guy who... If you were were to zoom in and isolate his persona at various points in his life and career, you would say, like, this guy is, you know, whether it's throwing someone through a plate glass window or various things that he's said, you'd be like, wow, this guy is, you know, that's going to really negatively affect his persona and stardom. But, like, there are some people who, no matter what they do, they're just likable, lovable. They always kind of bounce back and, like, maybe instead of just focusing on you know, John Morant or, you know, Derrick Rose, like maybe he could be Charles Barkley. Yeah. Chuck is, Chuck is pretty Teflon. Is he not like I, Chuck is, seems like a pretty tough guy for people to in any coordinated long-term way to, to find distasteful or not to like. And it's not like he hasn't provided a handful of opportunities for the, the intelligentsia to, to feel that way about him, <laughs> but it doesn't feel like it, it doesn't feel like it's happened. At least for now, Anthony Edwards is somebody that people want to root for. This can f- change on a dime with like if he demands a trade or what, it, or if he misses a shot in a game seven. Like obviously, sports fandom is is fickle. But Joel, I think he's a guy that people seem to want to like and are rooting for to succeed and want to forgive to the extent that he does things that might not be cool. Yeah, right. And I again, like, I think to Alex's earlier point, you know, bringing up all the things that LeBron did, it's further evidence that we all end up memory holding a lot of this stuff, depending on what, you know, we want to like the guy, we don't want to like the guy. And if we want to like Anthony Edwards, you know, in 2030, um, we won't bring up, you know, the, the, the abortion thing, or we won't bring up the anti-gay comments, right? And if you want to stay a fan of LeBron, you won't bring up that he didn't say anything, uh, you know, critical about the Cleveland police after the shooting of Tamir Rice, right? Like, only if you want to use that against him will you remember it. And so I don't think it'll matter. And so if you can throw all that aside, then yeah, man, like, he's fucking cool to watch, man. Like, I mean, I you know, I like watching some Anthony Edwards Highlands. I think the thing this is sort of weird, and you guys just kind of wrote me with this for a second. A world in which the Minnesota Timberwolves are good. Like, you know what I mean? Like, just, like, they've been consistently good now for two or three years, and it looks like, I mean, they're the third seed this year. I don't think they're better than the Nuggets, but, like, I'm just kind of shocked that, like, the Timberwolves are good now, and it's just, like, an immutable fact of life. I mean, assuming that the Nuggets beat the Lakers, this will be the chance for Anthony Edwards to go up against the NBA champs, to go up against the MVP, to go up also against Jamal Murray, who's a great guard. But, um, you know, Edwards was in the movie Hustle, which is a great movie, and he was great and super charismatic in it. But, you know, Alex is a guy who is, you know, focusing mostly on college sports. Like, he chose a path in going to Georgia where they didn't make the NCAA tournament. He did not get the kind of bump in name recognition and stardom. Like, he was the number one pick, but he wasn't Zion. Like, he didn't come into the league with the rep or with name recognition or popularity. And so it's kind of impressive that he's built this in the way that he has, but he has these opportunities now with these playoffs, with the Olympics coming up, where it seems like he'll probably have a starring role on a team with, I I called it the gerontocracy at the top of the show, but like there's a literal Olympic torch and LeBron and Steph and KD 
are going to be on this team, but it wouldn't surprise me if Ant is the one taking, you know, shots in the fourth quarter and, you know, being the guy that people kind of talk about and point to after these Olympics. As far as I'm concerned, Anthony Edwards did not play college basketball. <laughs> I am looking at the sports <laughs> reference page that says that he was on a 16 and 16 2019-20 Georgia basketball team coached by Tom Crean. Uh, so he played one season at Georgia and then the world ended at the end of that season when they were going to miss the tournament anyway. Uh, I have no memory of him in college basketball and I watch college basketball unlike most. He just emerged fully formed in the NBA. That's my point. Alex, seriously, no, because ser- this is, a. am I'm, I'm happy you mentioned this because, you know, I try to watch college sports too, but if you see Georgia basketball on TV, like you turn. Next. Right? Like, Next. <laughs> there's never been a time it's like, okay, there's another game Georgia going fans up do this. Right? I know, look, yeah. I know a lot yeah. of Georgia fans. I'm sure you do too. Josh, you're an SEC footprint guy. I'm sure you know him too. I know one Georgia fan who religiously went to Georgia basketball games when a student. The, the other ones don't even really acknowledge that they might have ever set foot in that Coliseum that they play those games in there. It, it exists. There's some Georgia fan listening to this who is getting hot right now as we talk about how nobody cares, <laughs> but most of us do not care in society about Georgia basketball, and uh, I think that's reasonably true of Georgia fans themselves. No respect for Dominique Wilkins or Contavious Caldwell-Pope, for shame. Coming up next, Stefan and I will be talking to Chad Salmilla about the cross-country skiing sensation, Jesse Diggins. We don't do ordinary. We believe that every sport should be epic. Every home run, every hit, every inning, every play. From the moments that are legendary to the ones that fly under the radar. Whether it's a walk-off, grand slam, or a base hit to center field. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment. It's never ordinary at Bet365. 21 plus only must be physically located in Virginia. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Can you set the stage a little bit so people understand what happened? In 1969, 14 black student athletes were kicked off their university's American football team for planning a show of support against racism. We were really protesting our treatment on the field. Amazing Sports Stories from the BBC World Service tells their story. We became brothers that day when he did that to us. We made a change. Fighting for what we deserve. Search for Amazing Sports Stories wherever you get your BBC podcasts. Last month in Falun, Sweden, at the final cross-country ski tour event of the season, Jesse Diggins just needed to finish in the top 20 to clinch her unprecedented, for an American, second overall World Cup title. But Diggins didn't coast in the 20-kilometer freestyle race and wound up dueling two Norwegians down the stretch for gold. Here's Chad Salmella on the mic for NBC Sports. Down the stretch, Diggins! Pulling away ever so slightly from Vang. Vang does not have an answer, nor does Kalva. Jesse Diggins will put a stamp on the season with a victory in Falun, Sweden, to finish the perfect season. Diggins will be World Cup champion and winner of the final day in Falun. Vang second, Kalva third. You may recall Chad Salmelo from the 2018 Olympics in Pyongyang and his amazing Here Comes Diggins call when Diggins and Keegan Randall won the first ever cross-country gold medal for the United States in the team sprint. We talked to Chad after that race, and he joins us again now to discuss Diggins' record-smashing 2023-24 cross-country season. Hey, Chad, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back. It's nice to be here. This was the most successful cross-country skiing season for an American ever. What did Diggins accomplish? Yeah, I, I think for the American sports fan, it's a big jump. Just to put it in perspective for people who don't follow skiing like I do, it's a big jump from that gold medal performance in Pyeongchang that everybody knows from the call that I went nuts on and everything. But it, that was a very exciting event. But it was a very specific event that Keegan and Jesse were, were custom fit to at that time in their careers. And it was not like 
Jesse Diggins and Keegan Randall were big. You know, they, they were not bullies of the World Cup. They were like they were getting their podiums here and there, and that gold was like a huge moment and a, tra- and a transformative point in their careers. I mean, Keegan was retiring, but Jesse was just starting to get to be kind of world class at that point. Since then, she's won the World Cup once. She's won the Tour de Ski twice. The Tour de Ski, of course, the Tour de France style mid-season big stress event. She's won that twice now. But again, she won that first World Cup in the COVID year when a lot of athletes weren't showing up and the United States just showed up as curious because they couldn't come back to the United States. So a lot of the Europeans would stay home and, and she won that World Cup that year. And it's, you know, it's, it's not necessarily an asterisk, but it's not the same thing as what she did this year. This year, Jesse Diggins was the best cross-country skier in the world, dominating. That's an amazing transformation from just six years ago because she had mastered a technique she really wasn't very good at back then, which is classic skiing, the the kind we all think about. She's a great skater. It has been her whole life, but she has struggled to nail the classic technique. And I would say that is the number one thing that she's done. And it's amazing because there are lots of people, even from Scandinavian countries, who haven't done that in their careers, who are great champions. And so in that respect, it's a pretty cool thing if you're a cross-country ski fan. That's great. And the thing that I think most people know about cross-country skiing when they think about it, or at least for me, is that the skiers collapse over the finish line. That's just sort of the the shorthand for like, this is the most physically taxing sport that any human can do. And so knowing that and watching, you know, the Olympics and seeing the toll that it takes, the thing that was most shocking to me and reading about this is that there's a 34 race season. Like when you think yes. about people who run marathons, like a top marathon runner will do I don't know, three races a year or something. Right. Why are we doing this to these poor athletes? 34 <laughs> races, Chad. That seems cruel. Well, there's some money to be made, <laughs> but not much. <laughs> no, I, I think the thing is that a lot of people ask that. I mean, cross country skiers are the fittest athletes in the world, and there's no doubt about it um, because they're using their entire body. And they're actually, you know, unlike cycling, they're 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 bearing their weight, but they're not pounding their body. Run, I'm a running coach after being a ski coach. I've been coaching running at the collegiate level for eight years since I, I, I coached for a decade in cross country skiing in college. And the wear and tear that you can withstand from skiing is 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 a bit different, just because of the fact that you're gliding on a ski and it's fairly elegant and it, it, and there's some there's some gliding factor to it. We'll just say. But I, I think the biggest thing is that you know they've proven they can do it for one thing. But it is it's it's really hard if you think about Jesse Diggins this season. She raced all 34 races. You know, she skipped out some of the relays, which was, you know, kind of questionable because she loves, she's always proclaimed to love the relay, the team events. But Is that unusual to do all 34? Not really if you want to win the overall World Cup. And this year doesn't have a world championship. So every two years is a world championship. Every four is Olympics. That leaves a one gap year where there's no world championships. And that's this year. And that's the other thing that there's no asterisk by. There was, there was no world championship this year. And she won the World Cup overall. That's like the big nugget. Like she won mm-hmm. the Tour de Ski and the overall. And the FIS, since her last Tour de Ski win, changed the scoring system. So the Tour de Ski doesn't matter as much to win the overall. It used to be the way they figured out the points system is that when you win the Tour de Ski, you almost had it, you almost had the World Cup overall Crystal Globe locked in the in the vault for the rest of the season. That wasn't the case this year with Jesse. She she started showing signs of coming apart, which was kind of nerve wracking if you're an American ski fan. The thing about Jesse Diggins that I think is important to try to understand better is that she's 32 years old. When she won that gold with Keegan Randall back in 2018, she was 32 minus six is 26. This is a sport where athletes continue to perform at a high level well into their 30s. But for the United States, that's never been the case. We've had cross-country skiers that have raced into their 30s. I remember writing about one, Sarah Conrad, at the 2006 Olympics. And for Diggins, the question in my mind becomes like, how does she get better? Like, how does she go from the Americans kind of suck, one medal overall since 1976, to suddenly Diggins at the top of the World Cup standings at the end of the year, but also other racers, too, that are turning the United States into one of the better teams in the world. Right. I think Jessie's is a story. She's at an intersection of a lot of things right now. And I I I hinted on the the technique mastery of classic technique, which is it's gymnastics level difficult to learn how to ski well, like to be a world class classic skier where you can be as efficient as these skiers who have done it so well since they were kids, like Norwegians and Finns, they, they've been classic skiing all their lives. And most Minnesota kids, because I, I am one, I mean, we grew up skating 
as a high school ski sport, and then we slow, slowly backed into classic ski racing. You know, I mean, mo- most people tour classic ski, but you know, the technique between a tour and somebody who's a world class skier is 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 much more complex. So you have this massive complexity of the classic technique, of which half the races are on the World Cup season. Jessie's great now. She's a great classic skier. And she, you know, two years ago, she was still in the metamorphosis stage, I would say. So that was a big thing. The other thing in the intersection that she's coming to is, is like you said, she, she's older. There is a grand total or grand sum of what aerobic training does for a human body. And the, the longer you do it, the better. But there, like you said, there's also a lot of wear and tear in that process. So if you if we look back to when Jessie Diggins was 18, for example, and she was a junior, she was maybe in the top 20 juniors in the world, top 15 juniors in the world, her age. Now she's the best at her age. She's the, like her birth year, she's the best skier in the world. And there are a lot of girls still skiing the World Cup who are in her birth year. So she has kind of come from behind and beat those athletes. Let's look at Krista Parmakowski from Finland. She was an absolute star. She was second in the Tour de Ski when she was 19 years of age. She's the same age as Jesse Diggins. I think there's some wear and tear there. I think that Jesse has just kind of outlasted and and her her trajectory as an american athlete starts later and we talk about that as coaches when when we're coaching world class or p- potentially world class athletes and they're developing as we talk about that age gap that your real age is not the same age as a norwegian at your real age a 22 year old Nor- american is basically a 17 year old norwegian <laughs> and you have to take that into consideration and that's i think why we're seeing jesse emerge that she's always been as or more talented than heidi vang Who's her age? Krista Parmakowski her age. She's always she's been at that level of talent, but it's taken this long for her to evolve into the athlete she is, and now she's better. and And it's a really cool thing to to see her realize that, especially knowing her. It's it's it kind of gives you goosebumps, you know. The first race of the season was in Finland, and she lost her pole and a glove, and had a bleeding gash. Her hand was exposed and sub-zero temperatures, and she yeah. still finished second. Is that kind of emblematic of the kind of mental fortitude that you have to have? Because everybody trains hard. You know, technique, I'm sure, is a differentiator, but yeah. just being able to withstand pain better than other athletes is probably important. Yeah, that's a huge topic when Jesse comes up to people who are really analytical of cross-country ski racing. And, and, and even, you know... I, I think people question as to does she really need to fall in the snow as dramatically as she does at the finish line? Does she really need to talk about giving it her all? And that race in Ruka that you're talking about, that is emblematic of her. And I, and I think like, you know, Je- Keegan and I are calling the first race of the, it's the third race of the season, the first weekend. And that happens. And we're like, oh, she, you know, in our minds, you know, off mic, we're like, she's screwed. She's not, she's not going to win this race because she's at the back. So there's less than a kilometer to go. It's about, you know, two minutes of racing left. And she's like 15 seconds back, you know, and, and she claws her way back. And honestly, if that race had been another 50 to 100 meters longer, she would have won it, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I, and I think that was a really good sort of a, a, a foreshadowing of what the season was going to be because she hadn't won at that point. She had, she didn't the, win either of the first two races. One was a classic sprint, which, which is one of her weaknesses, and one of the distance classic, which is also not one of her weaknesses, but she did well in that classic race. Came back in that skate race, and, and then from that race where she finished second, every freestyle race, distance race this season, she won up until her home race in Minneapolis. She had won every single one of that st- that discipline. And then she was third in Minneapolis. And, and that just told you that there was, you know, that I think that there was so much stress on her and so much fatigue over the course of a season that the one race that she was dominating at, she actually got beat at, at the race she wanted to win the most. <laughs> You mentioned that race in Minnesota. From what I read, she had lobbied to get a World Cup race to come back to the United States and to do it in her home state, not far where from where she grew up. Must have been a, a, a big moment for her. How did that weekend go? And you must have been there. Did you watch that one? I was, yeah. And it was the one show that we did on NBC this year, like NBC proper. It was, it was absolutely thrilling. As, as a Minnesotan, as well as an American ski fan and a ski and a ski commentator. I can tell you that that race wouldn't have happened without Jesse Diggins. And in fact, the hurdles that had to be overcome, including a pandemic. I mean, this, this World Cup was supposed to happen like five days after they shut us down for for COVID back in 2020. So the World Cup was already organized for 2020. It didn't happen. 
And then it finally did happen. And I think that was part of the response of the crowd. Like, I think so many people were so bummed out in 2020 that they really, they were going to make sure they showed up for this one. But yeah, to answer your question, Jesse Diggins basically was asked, I don't remember who asked her, but she was asked after that Olympic gold medal in Pyeongchang, what's your wish list? And she said, for, this is the first thing she said is, I want a World Cup in Minneapolis. I want a World Cup in my hometown, in my home state. And, you know, without her, it doesn't happen. But even more so, I think what it did is, it kind of shook the tree of, of all the ski fans in the United States. There were people from all over the United States and even the world who showed up to that event. And it was there to see the U.S. skiers, but it was there to see Jesse Diggins ski on her home course. And it was it was electric. Uh, um, Tina Dixon, who does X Games for NBC, was our field reporter on the day. And, and she was hanging out with me that whole weekend. And she could tell on Friday, before the athletes were even really warming up to race, the atmosphere of that venue, she said, felt special. She said it felt like the Olympics, and and she doesn't feel that at, at the X Games because you know it, it is a, it was a it was a media production, of course, in in Minneapolis, but there was also something very visceral and real to the people who were putting it on and the people who were coming to see it, and it did it. It felt like you know it's easy for me to feel that way because I was there at the last World Cup twenty one years ago or twenty three years ago, and I was there at the last one in Minnesota in nineteen eighty five. It's come a long way. So it was like, you know, Jesse Diggins has everything to do with it. And she did a lot of the work to raise the money. And, and it, was, uh, it was very special. I think that uh, anybody who was there is going to remember that the rest of their lives is one of, the, one of the high points, one of their highlights of their sporting experiences. Before this most recent World Cup season, she announced publicly on Instagram that she'd had a relapse of an eating disorder that she'd first started to get treatment for when she was back in high school. Um, so let's listen to a, a clip of, of some of what she said on Instagram. Hey everyone, I have something I wanna share with you, although it isn't easy. Um, after 12 really great years of health, I've been struggling with my eating disorder this summer. I'm doing quite a lot better now, thanks to my amazing care team, and I reached out for help to them right away. But I think it's important to share because this isn't a picture perfect recovery story. It's real and it's raw and it's messy and that's okay. I think sometimes we project that in order to be successful, you have to be perfect and struggle with nothing and that's just not real life. It's okay if you need to lean on your support team, which is what I'm doing right now. For me, this hasn't been about food or body or training or skiing at all. It's been about putting too much pressure on myself and feeling stretched too thin by all the projects that I've been taking on. Chad, you've known Jesse since she was a teenager. Um, and the fact that she's talked openly about her struggle with eating disorder, I know it's very important to her. It's a very important issue to her. But also, just as an athlete in this incredibly high-stress sport, just the fact that she was able to step back, know within herself that she needed help, and also to announce it publicly before she had this amazing season, it just makes the whole thing all the more remarkable. Yeah, it, it's amazing. I mean, you know, I, I've coached endurance sport now for almost 20 years at the collegiate level. And this is not an issue that is like hidden or buried anywhere. It, it's like, it's pretty prevalent. This is, these sports, endurance endurance sports, especially running, cross country skiing, even cycling, disordered eating is, is an all too common aspect of the sport. And, and it comes from a place where, you know, power to weight ratio is a really big factor of success. And when you get highly motivated people who are competitive and really want to win, an eating disorder is really just a step away. It, it can be a, a comment from a coach like myself. You know, like I try to be very careful with this topic. It's a, it's a topic close to my heart as well, too, because I've, I've dealt with enough um, fallout from this, even at the Division three college level, just to put it in perspective, that this is prevalent enough that Jesse speaking out about it, in my mind, is massive. It's um, I think she's pulled back the covers on the sport. I think I actually think she's had a, a, an impact in Norway, in Norwegian women's skiing. I think that, that, that some of the stuff that we're seeing ha going south in the women's Norwegian program is, is linked to this very issue, and Jesse's speaking about it. I think it's been a worldwide impact. Uh, not just in, for American girls and American men. I mean, men men have have the same problem. The fact that she could admit it and then come back and have the season she had it it, it makes you wonder. Even as a coach who has dealt with, I, I know this. I know this 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 uh, problem. And for her to do that is so incredibly courageous and hard because the very thing she's trying to fight 
she's fighting it every time she's succeeding because there's a vicious cycle of success feeding that 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 behavior that creates the the, the neuroses and and the difficulty of, of keeping calories in it. and I'm so in awe of Jesse the more I, the more I watch her that um, she's just she's such a transformative figure in so many levels Chad before we let you go we would be derelict in our host duties <laughs> if we didn't look back to that call of yours from the 2018 Olympics in Pyeongchang. <laughs> Let's just play the clip. I could listen to this clip every day. It's you and Steve Schlanger of NBC Sports on the play-by-play. -play. They're all completely gassed. They've given it everything on the global bucket. It's Steve Nelson leading Jesse Diggins into the final turn. Can Diggins answer? As the roars rattle around the cross-country stadium in Pyeongchang, Sweden, the U.S. and Norway come into the line. Here comes Diggins! gold medal for the U.S. Let me ask you, how has that sort of changed your career and your life? I mean, it really is an iconic sports broadcasting moment. Yeah, well, thanks. I mean, I, I mean, this is really cool to be on a podcast of, of this of this level. I mean, you guys get you guys have a lot of listeners. And it's really cool that you appreciate that, and and I and I appreciate that you appreciate that. In terms of it making me famous or making money for me, not really. I mean, I think that really it's it's such a we're we're kind of we're a small we have a small fan base, and that's that's the reality. I, you know, I I got five years of. Working for NBC when they had the uh, the Olympic Channel, which was really great for me personally, just professionally, because I think it it allowed me to move from that point and sort of solidify myself in the consciousness of the sport and people who were going to follow it. And and I think that in that respect, it's changed my life quite a bit because people I didn't have any fans <laughs> before that, and and I, and I you know I, th they're few, but but I have some fans, you know, which is really cool. I mean, anybody who gets gets fans is is a lucky person. So, I mean, in that respect, yeah, there's some, there's some emotional and some, there's some value at the heart of it all to me, but you know, is it making me wealthy? No, not really. No, I mean, I, I'm still doing some commentary as streaming um, with, with NBC folding the Olympic channel. I'm hopefully get to do their next Olympic games again in the sports that I know. And, and that's cool in itself, but for the most part, I still got to scrape a living together with uh, coaching in a collegiate level and, and at podcasting and, and doing some calls in the winter. What I would say about that call is that announcers play such a huge role in a sport like cross-country skiing and explaining it to fans who don't know the sport. But in a moment like that, you are a part of how that moment will be remembered forever, um, which must feel really cool. But also, there's no way to replicate it or recreate it. The, right. the emotion of that moment, the fact that it was a first... And the kind of sincerity behind, and uh, you can hear the like kind of decades, both for you and for the whole community in that call. And that's what really, if even if you don't understand the sport at all, you can hear that in your voice in the moment. And that's why I think that call will just like, it really has stood the test of time for six years. And it'll be something that people listen to, you know, for as long as we're you know, as long as the Olympics exist. It's the joy, Chad, that you expressed and the pure emotion, the excitement that not just you <laughs> were watching, but that sort of everyone who's been part of that sport was experiencing. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. It, 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 it planted in my heart immediately because I think I, I, that my first reaction when I came out of the booth was, was that too much? And I asked the producer, because you know you don't see yourself, you don't know what it looked like or what it felt like and sound like. And we're in a we're in a quiet sound booth well, you're in, in Connecticut, Connecticut, not in Connecticut, Chang, right? Yeah. And I don't know if I told this told this on the last time I was on it six years ago, but I you know the first time I realized it was a good thing. Well, first of all, my producer assured me he goes this is going to be big, and I'm like, you, okay, thanks. Well, it's great. And I walk out of the sound booth, and the four sound technicians gave me an ovation, which was really cool. I mean, they're hearing everything, you know, the all Olympics long, and they and they clapped, and I was like. Well, thanks. And I, w I remember going to my hotel. I was going to air for about six or seven hours. And I'm like, lay down in my hotel room, and I just I felt like I felt like okay, I've I've done what I came to do. That's it. Uh, if I get anything else, it's great. But but I don't think you get an opportunity like that. I don't. I think that 
that being the first gold medal, I mean, Keegan could have won a gold medal in the sprint four years earlier, and it could have been completely different. Jesse could have won a bronze medal. She was close to winning the bronze medal in the 10-kilometer freestyle three days earlier. If that would have been the first medal, that would have been completely anticlimactic, but comparison to this being the first one. So there's like, you know, there's like multiple layers of that story that lead to that moment. And, you know, you could, I, I've said it before, you could live three lifetimes and never get that moment as a commentator ever again. And it's, you know, just, it was like lightning striking. It was really cool. And, and I'm, I'm proud of it, of course. Do you believe in miracles? One, here comes Diggins. All right, 1A. Okay, give me 1A, <laughs> yeah, awesome. Chad. Chad Salmella is the head cross-country running coach and assistant track and field coach at the College of St. Scholastica in Duluth, Minnesota. He's a one-time member of the U.S. biathlon team and a cross-country skiing commentator for NBC Sports. You can hear more of him on the podcast Threshold, which he hosts about endurance sports. Chad, thank you for coming on the show. That was really fun. Thanks, guys. It was great to see you again. Now it is time for After Balls, sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice, endorsed by Kenny Sailors, who says it was okay. The NFL draft was, more than anything else, Louisiana's moment to shine, and not just because LSU's own Jaden Daniels and Malik Neighbors went number two and number six overall. The real winner was LSU receiver Brian Thomas Jr.'s mother, Sandra Thomas, Brian Thomas Jr. going in the first round to the Jacksonville Jaguars, and Sandra was interviewed by ESPN's Laura Rutledge. Sandra, how far has this family come? We came from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. All-time greatest NFL draft moment. Leslie Nielsen and the Naked Gun couldn't have said it any better. But wait, there's more. Florida State wide receiver Keon Coleman of Opelousas, Louisiana, just 20 miles east of my grandmother's hometown of Eunice, had this to say about his yellow puffer jacket during his introductory press conference in Buffalo. Guess, guess where I got this from, though? Where you I'm saying you got to guess. You're going to be wrong, though, but guess. Time is up. Nah. Macy's. What you mean? <laughs> they, be on, they be on sale on the, on the rack. All the colors. But Joel and Alex, the lessons from Keon Coleman did not end there. Shop like my mom. I get my coats in the summertime. You got to shop two se- a season or two before, just in case, you know, and they be cheaper. Because you go at Thanksgiving, everybody in Thanksgiving, you know what I'm saying? My favorite thing about this is that the press conference had not even actually started <laughs> when he was dropping this coat knowledge. And the presser ended with him asking if he could grab some snacks that were over on a side table, which in his defense, they did look like some really excellent snacks. Uh, you ever go to Opelousas, Joel? Oh, I've been to Opelousas a couple times. Yeah, man. I didn't know that your grandmother was from Eunice. Of course. Yeah, man, it's not too far from, I think my grandmother's from Caldwell, something like that. Anyway, yeah. Joel, what is your Keon Coleman's yellow puffer jacket? So in my most recent emotional investment column, I wrote about Caitlin Clark and what I believe to be the unpromised future of the WNBA. Basically, the thesis is this. Some of us have been around long enough to understand that uninterrupted growth is never promised when it comes to women's professional basketball. And if you doubt me, keep in mind that I used to be a Houston Comets fan. Um, but to illustrate that, I, in, in this piece, I reached all the way back to the 1970s in Iowa, where maybe the best female analog to Caitlin Clark got her start, Molly Machine Gun Bolin. The sports economist Dave Barry brought Bolin up during our conversation last week, and once I started reading about her, it was kind of hard to stop, and, and I'll try to keep it short here in recapping some of her life. But in the 1970s, Bolin became one of the nation's first real women's basketball stars. Uh, she dominated the three-on-three half-court format of Iowa School Girl Hoops, becoming one of the most prolific scorers in the country. She scored 50 points in her first high school game, 70 in her last, and her high school best was 83. And in 1975, and this is, you know, before the days of you know, the NCAA has really come in and support women's sports, Bolin went on to a little small junior college in Des Moines called Grandview College. Um, she had a pretty successful freshman year there, averaging about 14 points a game. But the next season, she had to miss because she buried her high school sweetheart and gave birth to her first child, a son named Damien. And so while she's away tending to her new family, Grandview dropped to 1-14, so obviously... 
They're going to say a lot of scoring. Uh, it's probably probably the problem there. So things turned around the next season when Bolin returned to the team. She averaged nearly 25 points a game, set a number of scoring records, and then graduated with an associate's degree in telecommunications. Later that spring, in June 1978, just a month after the reader here was born, by the way. That's me. me. I'm the reader. I'm the guy reading it. I was born right then. Anyway, Bolin became the first woman to join the new Women's Professional Basketball League. And it was there that she became a star, helping the Iowa Cornets reach the championship finals where they lost to the Houston Angels. Shout out Houston. The Cornets led the league in attendance and Bolin earned a feature in Sports Illustrated headlined, The Lady is a Hot Shot. But there were signs of trouble. Bolin said she was making about $6,000 a year. And when her attempt to get a raise failed, she started making her own 18 by 24 black and white posters. She posed in a tight fitting tank top and shorts and took the posters to games to sell to fans. It worked out pretty well and made her into an even bigger star. And here's a line from that Sports Illustrated profile that hopefully won't make you cringe too much. Suffice it to say that if beauty were a stat, Molly Bolin would be in the Hall of Fame. So, yeah, it's a very serious profile. There was some obvious downsides to that kind of attention. And here's a clip of us talking about last week. Back then, you could either be the girl next door or you could be, you know, uh, put in put in the, the sexism part of it. So I was like, down the street, I guess, let's right? do it. Let's do it all, you know, yeah, right. because <laughs> it's going to appeal to different people. And why should why should I cut out any aspect of the market? Let's do it all. So I had two poses of posters come out and I was mail ordering business, carrying them to and from the games, uh, selling them at the games. It worked. You know, people came in, people wanted the posters and everything. And, and I got a lot of backlash for that because it was looked at as um, exploitation, a lot of sexism. What did you feel the, the pushback most acutely from media, from fans, um, what or players? I think it was more that the league tried to run with it and trying to get other players to do the same thing I was doing. And I was just being me. Right. I wasn't trying to be anything, but you can't make everybody else do that. Regardless, the posters weren't enough to make up for the lack of resources and investment in the WBL. So Bolin fled to a competing league, the Ladies Professional Basketball Association. But that didn't work out either. She returned to the WBL for the 1980-81 season and signed with the San Francisco Pioneers, which were then coached by former New York playground legend, college All-American, and former NBA player, Dean the Dream Memminger. Uh, Memminger, by the way, later preceded his old Knicks teammate, Phil Jackson, his head coach of the Albany Patroons. But anyway, Bowen thrived with Memminger and the Pioneers, finishing second in the league in scoring and earning her third All-Star nod. But by then... The WBO was truly on its last legs, and that proved to be its final season. Bolin didn't have anywhere else to go to try to make it as a professional, and so she tried playing some pickup ball and then some men's amateur leagues to keep her career going. In 1984, she played for a team of former Olympians and pros that competed against that year's U.S. Women's Olympic team. And later that year, she also played in the Women's American Basketball Association. But that only lasted a season, and it was her last one as a pro. And while her playing career stalled, Bolin spent the next few years trying to create a new women's pro league in the States. Well, I never gave up on the idea that it was going to work. I mean, every time um, Bill Byrne, who was the commissioner, who it was his idea to start women's pro basketball right after Title to take advantage of Title IX, because he knew there was going to be an explosion in the growth of women's basketball after Title IX. He would call me up periodically, Molly, I'm going to start another league. You know, you got to go talk to this owner, you got to promote this or do this interview or fly here and do a press conference. I was always there. Fox brought her in in the mid 1990s to launch another women's basketball product for TV. But once again, timing wasn't on her side. So in the mid 90s, just prior to the WNBA, I had approached, um, the, of course, the cable companies were were growing like crazy. Um, ESPN were starting to broadcast women's college games. And I, I uh, pitched an idea to do a uh, short court three on three tournaments, sort of like they're doing now, three on three tournaments to promote uh, women's pro basketball players until we got the league going and they accepted my proposal. And I was putting that together. I was working with Liberty Sports that was in the process of getting bought out by Fox Sports in 1995, 96, right through there. Oh. And we were going to do this made for TV. Yeah. You know, they have a made-for-TV 
venue um, to give women ba pro basketball players an opportunity to play and compete and to to win and to have be paid. So that's what I had tried to create um, during that period of time, just prior to the WNBA announcement. What luck, right? I did want to be involved. I felt like, how can they do this without me? I've been doing this all this time. But, you know, it was it was very bittersweet because you see the success of it. Like, I remember going to the, I got invited to go to the 10th uh, All-Star Game in Madison Square Garden. And I just had this flashback of playing the All-Star Game there. And there was, you know, 600 people in the gym, <laughs> you know. And then here I am at the WNBA All-Star Game and it's sold out. Yeah. And I'm just sitting there going, wow, this is amazing. This is exactly what I I could could uh see years ago. And that was that was the vision, that was the dream. And there it was. But I was on the outside looking in. It was kind of a bummer. Mm -hmm. But still at the same time, it was amazing to see it be successful. Today, Molly Bolin goes by the name Molly Kasmer and works as a realtor in Southern California. And she's still involved in basketball, is vice president of the Legends of the Ball organization that continues to promote the women's game. And she probably wouldn't mind it if our listeners checked out their website and considered supporting the organization, which will also host its annual golf tournament in Houston later this year, presumably because of the Houston Angels' uh, first WBL championship, but I'll have to check with her to get clarity on that. But seriously, uh, Molly Bolin, one of the game's legends, and it was a lot of fun to talk to her. And So here's the thing that I wanted to say about Nancy Lieberman Klein at the top of the show. And I didn't get a chance to flesh this out, but you all walk with me. She's really close with Caitlin Clark, okay? Yeah. Like, Caitlin Clark texts her all the time. She calls her a goat. Nancy Lieberman Klein also used to work with Ice Cube in the Big Three. Right. Like she and Ice Cube are really good friends. So if I'm trying to figure out how that Caitlin Clark to the big three thing happened. For five million dollars. For right? five million. I'm kind of, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I wasn't able to ask about that. But afterwards, I was able to make a little bit of a connection. So maybe something there, maybe not. That was great, Joel. Glad you were able to reach uh, Molly Bolin. I put uh, a link in our, our Zoom chat here. I think, was that the, the poster that you're talking about? Let's see. You, know, click. you guys are hearing me. Look. Oh, that's the one. Yep. Podcasting that is a visual medium. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I can see what you're talking about in terms of, you know, how she had to portray herself to try to get attention. We can link to it on our, our show page, the, the Molly Bull and Iowa Cornets poster. Yeah, man. It was, I mean, man, it's just kind of funny that people go to the, we'd go to NBA games and maybe buy a Michael Jordan poster in the 90s. We just imagine going to the game, buying that poster and going home and I just, I don't know, it seems a little weird, you know? That is all for this episode. But we've also got a bonus <laughs> episode that's live right now on Nick Saban and Bill Belichick, NFL Draft commentators. To hear our reviews, subscribe to Slate Plus on Apple Podcasts by clicking Try Free at the top of our show page or visit slate.com forward slash hang up plus to get access wherever you listen. The episode is available right now. We'll see you there. Our show notes are at slate.com slash hangup, and you can email us at hangup at slate.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. For Joel Anderson and Alex Kirshner, I'm Josh Levine. Remember Zelmo Beatty, and thanks for listening. At Bet365, we don't do ordinary. We believe that every sport should be epic. Every home run, every hit, every inning, every play. From the moments that are legendary to the ones that fly under the radar. See for yourself when you sign up today and get $150 in bonus bets when you bet just $5. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment, it's never ordinary at Bet365. 21 plus only must be physically located in Virginia. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Terms and conditions apply.